so what's being handed out is a, um, it's actually a, a spreadsheet that I'm, I've been working on, sort of um, something I do to sort of unwind. Um, just, it's the gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I synchronize them um, line by line, uh, verse by verse, word by word at some points. And so this section that you're getting on the handout is the section on the man with the withered hand. Um, so Matthew 12, Mark 3, Luke 6. So that you can sort of follow along as we go through our class this morning and see where we're at. There, they'll also be on the screen also, this, the exact section we're looking at. But um, So this morning we're at, uh, let's see, this is, did I change slides already? I did. This is um, class number 14 of our series, um, and this is miracle number 11 in our series. So what we have, um, the way the gospel is written, it says, and I put the first line of the previous story, so to speak, but it's for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Because the way that the gospel writers are tying these events together with the Sabbaths, one Sabbath, the Sabbath before this, not immediately before this, but the Sabbath in the story before this was when the disciples were going through plucking um, ears of corn. So they were threshing and reaping and harvesting. And, the, and the, the Pharisees were like, they're doing that which is unlawful on the Sabbath. So these, these gospel writers are bringing these stories together to highlight a point. And unfortunately, plucking the ears of corn is neither a miracle or a parable, so to speak. Um, so we're not going to dig into that, otherwise we'd need another 45 minutes. So, just to, I just, so that's just to emphasize the fact that these Sabbath stories are linked together for a reason. Um, in John 8, he heals an impotent man for 38 years, so we did have a class on that. Um, and then Matthew 12, 1 through 8, the disciples pluck the ears of corn, and that's the second Sabbath after the first. And then Matthew 12, 9 through 14, he heals the man with the withered hand. Um, when he was departed thence, so they're not consecutive Sabbaths, and it's just they're grouped together to emphasize a principle. And he says, he entered again, Mark says. He entered again into the synagogue. So the point of the Sabbath is not to abstain from doing work, but to abstain from doing selfish works. Okay, it's a time for doing good works, works to glorify and serve God. Uh, deeds must be provoked from what we hear, and what we hear, they have to provoke good deeds. And the man with the withered hand listened to Jesus and had it heal, because he listened. Um, so there's a spiritual principle expressed in that action, which will come out as we go through the story. Um, one verse from the Psalms that expresses... Um, this can be found Psalm 143, verse 6. Um, 143, verse 6. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. So you see this link with stretching forth hands unto thee. So we stretch, what are we stretching forth our hands for? Our soul thirsteth. After thee is a thirsty land. So this man's hand was withered. It was dried up. It was thirsty, so to speak. And that's the same with our, not physically, but that's the same idea with our right hands. They are thirsty. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Um, so it's the same word, just like in Psalm 143, David says, My soul thirsteth after thee is a thirsty land. So it's the same idea presented in both linking that idea of the dry, withered hand and being thirsty with our soul thirsting as a, as a thirsty land. So Brother Robert Roberts says, The Sabbath was ordained for rest and refreshment, not for penance and oppression. So there's a lot of legalistic, pharisaical laws. If you ever look through the... Uh, was it the Talmud, the Torah? I, forget, I get those two confused. Torah is the first five books, right? The Talmud is the oral. There's some ridiculous things in there about, uh, you know, 
ch- eat chickens and egg. You can't eat an egg a chicken laid on the Sabbath because the chicken worked. And if you brush it, you can't. If you have a toothache, you can't swish with vinegar, but you can put the vinegar on a toothbrush and brush your to- brush your teeth. It, it's just because if you you can put the vinegar in your mouth, but you have to swallow it because if you spit it out, that's working. It's, it's, and that's how ridiculous these things are, and, and, they're, and that's the um, and that's the Sabbath penance and oppression that that the, Jew, the Jewish uh, Pharisees were looking, watching Jesus to see how he breaks the Sabbath and how his disciples, how he encourages rebellion, and and so as Brother Robert says, it's ordained. The Sabbath was ordained. It was a time of rest and refreshment, not for penance and oppression. Another uh, interesting uh, characteristic that comes out when you compare the three records, you'll notice that Matthew says he went into their synagogue. And this uh, brings our minds back to the healing of the madman. Um, When there was a madman in their synagogue. Um, That was a few classes back. But uh, Matthew 12 says he went into their synagogue. And as I said, Mark entered again into the synagogue and so that synagogue, I, um, I'm not to be dogmatic on it, but I'm pretty, I would be pretty comfortable saying it was the synagogue in Capernaum, in his city. So it was a familiar synagogue that he went into, um, but it was their synagogue. And just like the madman in the, in the original story uh, was a symbol of the madness that was in that synagogue, here you have a man with a withered hand in their synagogue, again symbolizing the fact that their synagogue had no strength of hand. It was bound up in the law. The law was, was uh, uh, inhibiting any, any of their ability to do anything. Um, so his city was a city of comfort in, Na- in Capernaum, Capernaum meaning a city of comfort, but their synagogue, there was a man with the withered hand, lo, says Matthew, behold, a crippled man, noticeably in attendance. So this is um, is sort of an exp- uh, uh, like uh, like lo, you know, it's like wow, there's a guy with a crippled hand. There he is, you know. And so we can't say whether or not the Pharisees brought him there to tempt him. At this point, it's not written one way or the other. Um, the thought has been put forward that. The Pharisees brought this guy in to see what he would do. Um, whether he did, they did or didn't is all conjecture at this point. Um, but lo, behold, there's a man with a withered hand. And Luke tells us that it was his right hand, which is significant. Not, I don't know if there's any left-handed people here, but we know any Bible student knows the significance of the right hand just in the fact that it, it is the symbol of Um, power, so to speak. Um, And that's not saying left-handed people aren't powerful. It's just that's predominantly the hand in Scripture. God is right-handed. Well, he's ambidextrous, I'm sure. But scripturally speaking, he's right-handed because it's always talking about the strength of his right hand and Christ sitting at his right hand. So the right hand is a symbol of of the ultimate power of of the, the person or in God's case, in his, you know, his ultimate strength. His hand is not short. Um, so it was his right hand. Um, Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 137, verse 5. I don't know if anybody knows what that is off the top of their head. I wouldn't, unless I had it in front of me. So don't feel bad. Um, 137, verse 5. Uh, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. So again, that psalm is emphasizing that right hand. Um, So if we forget Jerusalem, if if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her coming. And Psalm 20, verses 6 through 7. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven. With the saving strength of his right hand, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So, again, just to emphasize that right hand. And, and I put that picture there just to make you think of the hand of the potter. Because it's not necessarily always a hand of 
with a sword in it, like going to go destroy everything and you know accomplish things. But he's also molding us as the master potter, and that takes skill and dexterity to form something that's of any value. And hopefully, each one of us feels that hand working in our lives, uh, shaping and forming us. And we are we aren't thirsty because if that if that lump of clay was parched and dry, the uh, master potter would have nothing to work with because there's no water. The word isn't in it. Um, So there was none of this in their synagogue. There was no power of the right hand. And we see they asked him. The attitude of the Pharisees, they asked him, they watched him. You can almost see the see the whisper of these men saying, is it lawful? Is it, let's see what is it lawful to heal, heal on the Sabbath day. Let's see what what he's going to do. And they watched him. They were looking. Why were they watching him? The question was to provoke his reaction and to judge him. That's what what they were watching for. They just wanted to condemn him, because on every front he's embarrassing their traditions and their and their. Uh, Egos, and their pride. He, he was embarrassing them, and he, so they wanted to catch him in doing something. Again, reading from Brother Robert Roberts from Nazareth for visit, he says he makes this observation: If a sincere and godly scruple, a fear of violating the will of God, had been the real inspiration of the question the Pharisees had put, it would have received some consideration at the hands of Christ, who was always patient and contrite. But such was not the case, as shown by their habitual disregard for the will of God on a hundred other things. So if they were actually sincere and wanting to know, is it lawful to, is this a good thing to do? Christ obviously would have been patient, explaining it to him, to them, making the point. He's not, he's not going to blow them off like they're idiots. That's not why he's mad at them. He's mad because he knows their base motive. He knows why they are watching him. He knows their hypocrisy and the hypocrisy of... He knows exactly what the record says, that they might accuse him. It says verse 7 of of Luke 6. That they might find an accusation against him, but he knew their thoughts. So we're told that. So if they were sincere, they would have gotten a sincere answer. So it's not like you know the, the teacher always say, you know, the only stupid answer is the one that's not asked. Um, that's not Christ's attitude. Christ's attitude is if you're sincere in trying to knock, seek, and find, he will do everything in his power to help you find that answer. That's what our that's what our Lord will do for those who are sincere. But if they're just watching him just to find an excuse, just to find a loophole so that they can condemn him and puff up their own motives and egos, then he has no patience for that. And he will look at them with anger as we come to see. So this question comes forth. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? But our Lord, the judge, asks him, as puts forth his own question. Luke 6, verse 9. So he asks them a question. But first... Well, he asked him, is it lawful? So the tradition, their, their, their verbal tradition says, yes, it is lawful to heal on the Sabbath if it's a matter of life and death. So this man with the withered hand was not in that category. It could have waited until tomorrow. He wasn't going to die. Okay, so they're saying, if it's a matter of life and death, it's lawful to do, to, to heal. But this is not the case. So what does he do? He asks the man to stand forth. So he was sitting in the audience, the man with the withered hand, and he and Christ asks him, come forward, stand in the midst, rise up, stand forth in the midst, and he arose and stood forth. So now this man, you can picture him coming to the front and standing. So you have Jesus, who was there teaching, which I sort of skipped over that um, from Luke 6 and 6. We know that Jesus was the one in that synagogue teaching. You have the Pharisees who are sitting in the front row, because that's where that's the seat of honor, and, the, and up near the, 
near the ark, so to speak, in the front. And he asks the man with the withered hand, come forward. So now he's standing up there and he's putting questions to them. He's turning it on them. And what's the question? Well, first, we, we, would, we don't want to lose the attitude of the man with the withered hand in this. Because uh, if you blow over it really quick, you'll see a, a conflict between Christ and the Pharisees and healing on the Sabbath. But then in this story is also the man with the withered hand. And he gives us a, a story of faithful obedience. So they're sitting there watching him. And he's sitting there listening. How do we know that he's listening? Because he obeyed. He did what was asked of him. So there's a little little picture of him coming forward, doing what the Lord asks him to do, standing in the in the front. So now, you know, when you have somebody with a, a with a like I was in Walmart the other day, and there's this guy with a withered hand, you know, and I'm like, wow, how's he going to ring up my purchase? This is sort of you know entertaining on a perverse sort of level, but it's like, how do you deal with this? Like. Like, because I have two hands, I don't have to deal with it. When you see somebody with this challenge, you sort of notice it. And you're like, how does that work? You know, how, how does that work? And so you, you see that example. If somebody came in here with a withered hand, we would all sort of like, hey, you know, how you doing? You're not really, hey, what happened to your hand? You know, it's like, that's not, that's totally uncomfortable. You wouldn't do that. Um, well, we shouldn't do that, I don't think. Some of us might. Yeah, so yeah, Leo had a stroke, so half of him doesn't work that well. Um, so it's, it's just interesting. But now he's standing up there. Everyone can see. All eyes are on him. Like, what, all right, what's going to happen? They're watching Jesus to see whether he was going to heal. So now he's visible to all. And he was listening and obeying. And now here's where, the, where it gets interesting, because um, in the chart that I gave you, there's, there's two questions that Jesus asks. Uh, one is, is, it, is, he just asks, is it lawful to do good, save life, or kill? And then he asks, uh, what man among you has a sheep? So, this is the, so you have this, the section from Matthew, what man of you has one sheep? And then you have the section from Mark and Luke, who don't talk about the sheep, but they talk about this one question, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days? Now, Eldersheim puts it, so that the sheep comes first. I think John Martin does too in the Life of Christ talks. He puts it so that uh, the question about the sheep comes first and then the question about is it lawful to do good. Brother Roberts of Nazareth for Visited has it the way that I put it in the handout just because that made the most sense to me. But you can't be dogmatic about it because you're, you're synchronizing Gospels. But it's help, It's really, I find it very rewarding to go through these exercises Trying to sink, and I encourage anyone to do the same thing just because it really makes you think. What did he do first? Did he ask this question first, or did he ask that question first? You know, and it sort of changes the tone of his argument when you sit and think about which one came first. But we won't really go through that because we're going to run out of time anyway. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that point of, of the order. When, you, when you're synchronizing the Gospels, subtle differences that come out. Um, so he says the Lord's second question, um, but it could have been his first. But the question is, is it lawful, right? And, you know, is it lawful? And, and their answer, if, if Christ had just simply asked exactly what they asked, is it lawful to heal? Their response would have been, not unless a man's life is in danger. It's not lawful unless someone's life is in danger. But that's not what Christ asked. He did not ask the question that they asked him. He raised it to another level. What did he ask? Is it lawful? He saith unto them, uh, Mark 3, verse 4, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And they held their peace. So he's ra- they asked him a legal question. Is it lawful to heal? He raises it to a moral question. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? To heal? It, you know, to um, 
Yeah, to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil, to save life or to kill. And so we have, um, oops, sorry. So we have this, uh, the, the, the dilemma presented to the Pharisees is that are you allowed to do good on the Sabbath day? And if they said it's, you're okay to do good on the Sabbath, now they're in a pickle. Because they would now have to give consent to that miracle. Because certainly it's a good thing to heal somebody. To give somebody something that they need, that's a good thing. So, to allow it would give consent to the miracle. But to deny it would be a monstrous evil. Um, So it's an evil to withhold a possible good. If it's in your ability to do something good for somebody and you don't do it, that is the same as, the, as evil. Uh, James 4, verse 17 uh, says, Therefore to him that knoweth, <clears throat> knoweth to do good and doth it not, to him it is sin. So if we know a good thing to do for someone and we don't do it, it's sin, says James 4. And that's the same principle. If we know we have the ability to heal this man and we withhold it, that's the same as doing evil. So what are they? They're silenced, says the record. Matthew, Mark, uh, sorry, Mark 4, verse 3, they are silenced by the question. Right? So they also, underneath this, you couldn't miss, they couldn't miss the illusion of why were they watching him? That they might find an accusation against him. That they might do evil in planning his murder on the Sabbath. You see Jesus sweeping the crowd with this mixed anger and grief. Anger and grief at the same time. Grief at the hardness of their heart. And anger at their hypocrisy. So let's go on to the other question asked of, uh, in Matthew 12. Which one of you having one sheep? So it's his only one. And you think of echoes back to David and Nathan. He had one sheep that was dear to him. But which one of you having one sheep so endeared to him? And again, going to their, their law, their oral tradition. If it's not injured, they say, leave it in the pit. Bring it food, fodder, leave it in the pit. But if it is injured, take it out of the pit and kill it. So that's what the law said. But they didn't, they didn't like that law, so they actually bent it. And they said, no matter what, pull it out of the pit with the intent of killing it, but don't kill it. So they're, they're thinking of all of these loopholes, all of these ways to get around their law because they care about the shekel. Because that's what that sheep represents to them, to the Jewish mind. That's, that's some shekel, that's some money. They cared more about that sheep than they cared about this man with the withered hand. It, it was totally over their head. So what of this man? What about this man? Which one of you, which one of anyone among you that shall have one sheep, if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man, this man, better than a sheep? And here's the answer to the question. Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. And that's sort of why I put that, put the two questions in that order, because I see Christ answering it. In Matthew 12, verse 12. Wherefore, it is lawful. But if you flip them around, you also have the Pharisees being silenced at the end of the questioning period. Which they were silenced at the end anyway. Anyway, I'll leave it up to you guys to decide which question you want first. I like it the way Brother Roberts did it in Nazareth Revisited. So what of this man? What does he say? Stretch forth thine hand. He calls upon the man. He calls upon the man to do the impossible. He says to that man, stretch forth your hand. It's, it's sure, he hasn't stretched it forth in his life. It's withered. He calls him to do the impossible. Stretch it forth. So after the man was told to stand forth in the midst of everyone, he then asks this man to do the impossible. And that is exactly, and I will say this until I'm blue in the face, that's what faith is about. 
doing what is humanly impossible. Having faith that God is able to do what the flesh is not. And that is save sinners, raise them from the dead, and deliver them into the kingdom. That's God's work. That's what we have faith in. That God is able to do these things. This was left to us. It was left up to me to save myself, to get myself in the kingdom. I'm lost. I have a withered hand in that regard. But if I have faith that he is able to do these things, that's the power of faith. Because our faith is in him. And that he wants us in the kingdom more than we want to be there ourselves. It's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom, right? So the man with the withered hand was told to stand forth, do the impossible, but unlike the Pharisees who are simply watching, this man is listening because he does what he's asked to do. And that's up. We have a withered hand. As far as the flesh is concerned, we each of us have a withered hand if we're going to rely on the flesh. But it's when we listen to the word of God and we do what we're com- follow his commandments, he that saith he abideth in him all of himself also so to walk even as he walked. If we do what is asked, he will give us strength to stretch forth our hands, to do the impossible. Um, so you can imagine this, the struggle of this man, the faith, because you have these, he's standing in front of the Pharisees, and you can see the Pharisees saying, don't you even dare. And so he has a choice. Listen to Christ, listen to Jesus, listen to the Pharisees. Don't stretch forth your hand. Don't do it. It's not lawful. Don't do it. And Christ has stretched forth your hand. So it was more than just a choice between having a withered hand and not having a withered hand. It was a choice between being associated with the Son of God, Jesus Christ, or those Pharisees in the front row. The, the ones that say it's not lawful. So it was, it was an act of faith on the part of this man with the withered hand. So the exhortation for us is to do something with what we hear. It's not enough just to listen. Being a do, we have to be a doer of the word as well. We have to do the commandments. Right? So stretch it forth. And the tense in the Greek implies that there's a, the healing took place in the action. So it's withered. As he brings it out, it's healed. Whole as the other one. So this man's faith in Jesus was greater than his fear of the Pharisees. As he's standing out in front of the Pharisees, you can see him reaching out his hand, almost touching their noses, so to speak. And that hand wasn't just stretched out for that man, for the man with the withered hand. It was stretched out for them if they would but just listen and do and repent, bring forth um, fruits, meat for repentance, if they would just turn. So that arm was stretched out for them if they wanted it. And the, pre- the power, Christ had the power present to heal them as well. And this ties in with the exhortation where Christ could have done anything. He could have come down from the cross. Doesn't matter. They saw these miracles. Christ didn't even touch this man. Everyone knows this man has a withered hand. He stood in front of them. Everybody's looked at it. They know. It's not a magic trick. They saw miracle after miracle, but they were blind. They didn't want to believe. And it was their choice not to believe. They have no excuse. So let's look at some examples. Maybe you guys can give me some examples when you think of people stretching forth their hand in stories in the Bible. Let's see if you come up with the ones that I... But I, that I've thought of. I'm sure there's more. The Good Samaritan didn't have that one. Who stre- did, the, did he stretch forth his hand to help him? Well, he didn't walk by. <laughs> okay, okay, I get it. All right, I get it. He didn't walk by. Yeah, so that is a, a picture of the principle. But I'm talking about actually sh- where the scripture says he stretched forth his hand. Yeah. Yeah, because there's ton. Obviously, there'll be tongue. We'll be here all day if we go through the principles. So, um, Peter, and when? 
when Christ was walking. Yeah, okay, that, I have that one. All right, another one? Oh, that's a good one. I didn't have that one. Yeah. Noah? Hmm? Um, Moses stretched forth his hand oh, well, many times with Moses. Um, one on the hill with um, Aaron and her holding up his hands, stretching up his If he put his hands down, Joshua lost. If he put them up, Joshua won. So that's, there's a principle there. The Red Sea, yeah. Stretched out his rod. The terminology and wording is different, but uh, the woman had, who had an issue with blood stretched out her hand to touch the garment of Jesus. So she stretched out her hand. Yeah, it says touch the hand yeah. of God. As an expression of her faith, just like this, yeah. Okay. Um, David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. So the angel had intention, but he, the hand was stayed, right? And that was um, over the freshening floor of, of who? Ornan. Ornan, yeah. Depending on what record you read, right? Is there any something else? Another? Anyway, so there's, there's that. That's uh, First Chronicles 21. All right, let me, let me give you a hint. What about that one? Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So Abraham stretched forth his hand, took the knife. Now, I've heard some people say, well, like say here's here's Isaac laying here and I'm going to kill him. He's stretching forth to take the knife to kill him. And obviously that picture has him having the knife. You're going to kill him. So something to think about in your own study to say um, and what that implies, what the two, what the difference implies. I'm not going to get into it because I'm going to run out of time. But when is that stretching forth, stretching it out to get the knife or is it stretching it out to kill him? Something to think about. But it's a symbol. And, and we know this from Hebrews in his mind. The deed was as good as done. He stretched forth his, his the hand to do something. Follow the commandment of the Lord. He was commanded to do. Um, and so he, and he was prepared to do it. And the idea is a quick movement to, 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 uh, to bring up that knife. All right. Um, let's see. Another one from Moses. What's that one? Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. Now, I know you see like the crocodile hunter or whatever. He picks up snakes by the tail. and I mean, that's theatrical. Theatrics, right? If somebody asked you to pick up a snake, how are you going to pick it up? How would you pick that one up? Would you grab that tail or would you grab the head? Yeah, right? I, ta- I was taught that in elementary school. You grab it behind the head because then it can't bite you if you're going to play with snakes, which I didn't do. Yeah. Some boys like to do that. Um, I didn't. But the command is... To take the snake by the tail. And again, it's an expression of Moses' faith. God said, he didn't just simply say, reach forth and grab the snake. Stretch forth your hand and grab the snake. He said, stretch forth, take the snake by the tail. Now, I guess you could argue the whole thing's a tail. It's a living tail, but I don't know. Anyway, it's an expression of his faith. Because if you grab a snake by the tail, chances are... Especially in that position, you're going to get bit. But because you, you know, and again, it goes to that that principle: expressions of faith don't make sense to the flesh. They are, they just don't make sense. They're not practical. Like, let's be practical and do this. We have to do this and that. It's like, no. When you're motivated by faith, we're doing things. That the flesh finds unnatural or unpractical, impractical, I guess is the word. So, yep, so you have that one. Here's another one, sort of opposite, sort of a contrast. Um, you know the story of King Jeroboam. And if you have it, if you flip this one up, 1 Kings 13, verses 1 through 10. Um, and we'll read this because I, I think there's a lot of echoes here to the, the events of this man. 
in his withered hand, his dried up hand, where he had it pulled in and he couldn't stretch it forth. King Jeroboam is confronted with this prophet. There came a man of God out of Judah, starting at verse 1 of of 1 Kings 13. By the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar and the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, that he cried against the altar in Bethel. Now pay attention to what, the, what this king does with his hands. He put forth his hand from the altar. Now, you know under the law of Moses, priests are the ones that minister to the altar, not the king, right? So here's this king, his hand. What is his hand doing, this wicked king? It's ministering on this false altar. He takes it off of the altar, stretches it for... Well, let me read the record. (laughs) Um... Put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up so that he could not pull it in again. So you see him, now his arm's sticking out like this and he can't do anything about it. And he's like walking around like, Hey, wait, come back here for a second. Can we fix this first? Before, you know, all this other stuff. But So his arm stuck out. The altar was rent, the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. Which to me is telling me that he went back to doing exactly what he did before. That hand that was ministering on that altar, doesn't matter. This sign, and again, it goes back to that, the, the exhortation, doesn't matter what sign they saw, they're still going to condemn Jesus in the end. And it's sad. It's absolutely sad. You see this, and it's, it, you saw the same story with Pharaoh. Miracle, the ten plagues. At the end of the story, he's still not getting it. But it speaks volumes of the care and compassion of our Heavenly Father. Because He knows the beginning from the end. He knows that they will never turn. But He still does everything He can to try and help them. He doesn't just say, okay, because He didn't make us robots. He didn't just make us do His will. He gave us a choice. And he rejoices in the choice of his children, choosing him. So this is that king. He stretches out his hand. So that's another story. So here's an example of someone who put forth his hand to do evil. And it was dried up. But in Matthew, in the record that we have, he stretched forth. We have an example of someone who stretched forth his hand in obedience, choosing Christ over the Pharisees. So the exhortation here for us is that our motives are to be for good and not for evil. If we don't use our hands for good, then they may as well be like Jeroboam's hands. So just picture that. If we're, if we're doing something wrong, just picture your arms sticking out and not being able to pull it in. So that's as good as it's, that's all it's good for, is to show God's righteousness. God is right and I'm wrong. Um... Steve brought this one up already. Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand to save Peter. Right? Immediately. And caught him. And he says, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? There's another record where Jesus stretched forth his hand. And that's when he asks, Who is my mother? Who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hands toward the, his hand toward the disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren... For whosoever shall do 
the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. So he stretches out his hand to us. We stretch out our hands to do good on the Sabbath or any other day. That's our duty, to do good. Uh, yeah. This could be a stretch, but what about Eve? Stretching forth to do evil. And take it. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, I think the more you meditate on the stretching forth of the hand, and what are they being stretched out to do? And it exhorts us, what are we stretching out our hand to do? To do evil or to do good? Is it lawful to do good or to do evil? And that was Christ raised the question to a moral level. And of course, Christ put forth his hands. His hands were stretched out on the cross. So we have the ultimate example of stretching forth hands in sacrifice for who? You know, for us. For Christ, by the commandment of God, doing the will of his Father in heaven. And that's what we want to do. We need to know what that will is and do it. So we need to stretch forth our hand. So, again, just to reiterate, we have a few minutes left. We must be listening, not just watching, like the Pharisees. And we must be acting on what we hear. What we hear has to motivate action in our lives. Just like the man with the withered hand, he stretched out his hand to be healed. If he didn't do what was commanded of him, he would have a withered hand. And that's the same for us. We recognize our weakness. But we also recognize the power of the commandments of our Father in heaven. And if we do his will, then we will, then we will be blessed. So our actions must be for good and not evil. So we're not to reach forth our hands for the things, the entertainment of this world, the remote controls to the TV. How often do we stretch that forth? How often do we stretch out our hand to pick up something evil versus stretching forth to pick up the Bible? You know, and that's a question we have to ask ourselves. And it's practical. It's a practical question that maybe it will help each one of us. Not, and again, not to say that I have it figured out. I, I don't want to come across as being like condemning you guys because I'm the one that has the same problem um, picking up the wrong thing and doing the wrong things. If, if you want me to do something, make a rule telling me not to do it and I'll do it. You know, that's me. Okay. Um, I'm just rebellion at heart. So that's what we need to remind ourselves to stretch forth our hands to do good and not evil. Um, And most importantly, I mean, we need to put forth our hands to each other in service to the Lord. Sowing the seed, doing our public lectures. You know, we never forget that Christ stretched forth his hands for us, nailed him having them nailed to the cross. So those people in the synagogue, they represented, they were all represented by this man with the withered hand. So they had no strength at all. Sort of like in Acts 15, you have the um, disciples proclaiming, they declared all things that God had done with them. And that has to be our focus. Not that we're going to go out and convert the world, but we're going to do the will of God. And it's what God does through us that's of any value, not what we do ourselves. So those in that synagogue in that day, their hands were all shortened by the law. Is it lawful to heal? Don't do that. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Rather than focusing on doing good, healing people, doing what you can. And we're told the Pharisees went out. They went out. Luke 6, verse 11 says, and they were filled with madness. They were... And actually the tense in the... um, In Young's literal, it says, the Pharisees having gone forth immediately with the Herodians were taking counsel. So it's like as if, as his hand is being stretched out, they're heading for the door. They, they don't even take the time to think. Jesus is here. That man is there. His hand is healed. Who did that? 
Who did that? Jesus, his normal practice was to touch people, touch them and heal them, as we see in, in many other miracles. They didn't even stop and consider who did that miracle. They were out the door doing evil. Again, reading from Brother Robert Roberts, um, Nazareth Revisited. Brief, emphatic words of command when he says, stretch forth thine hand. So just bre- that's all Jesus said, stretch forth thine hand. There's no incantations, no mummery, nothing resembling the mystic ceremonies of, of Greek priestess, priestess or Persian magicians whose nonsense is reflected in the plays of Shakespeare and the rites of performing wizards and necromancers. The word of God is powerful as lightning and needs no mystery mongering. So you have these, uh, you think of the churches around us who have, come up and be healed. No, you know, it's all this ceremony, you know, be healed and boom, the guy falls down and walks away, whatever. You know, that's not the word of God. The word of God is stretched forth in your hand and it's done. That's all it needs to be done. There's no, oh, you know, none of that. But I thought that, I thought he put that well. There's no, the word of God needs no mystery mongering. So they never stop to consider who performed the miracle. They were filled with, they were absolutely insane with rage. They were insane. They were mad. That word madness is used twice in the New Testament. They were so mad, they were so crazy, insane, they held a council on the Sabbath day. They're watching him whether he would heal on the Sabbath, and then they go out with their enemies, the Herodians, and hold a council on the Sabbath day, immediately. That's how absolutely insane pride is in the flesh. On the Sabbath. And to what intent? To kill him. To kill him. To to destroy him. It it couldn't be more plain, but they were... And with the Herodians, no less. And they were enemies brought together by their pride. So again, that Greek word for madness is only used twice in the New Testament. Um, 2 Timothy 3, verse 9. It's not without coincidence. And I'm out of time. But I'm going to highlight this really fast for you guys. Um, so 2 Timothy 3 and 9 um, talks about starting. Well, this know also that the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, Fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning yet never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further. For their folly, and that's that word, their madness shall be made manifest unto all men as theirs also was. So you look at that list, that laundry list of, of bad behavior, and that's the Pharisees. And they were absolutely insane in their madness. So it's the same Greek word that Luke uses for the scribe, the madness of the scribes and Pharisees, their folly. And that word means a want of understanding, madness expressing itself in rage. I'm just going to skip through that. I think you get that point. But it's just uh, the way Paul is bringing the, the Pharisees that w- just by that use of that word, the mind of the Pharisees in that that day on the Sabbath with that man with the withered hand and the mind of the flesh, which that list that he gave. So it shows us how 
uh, Paul showing us the characteristics that we must shun in ourselves. Obviously, we don't want to have any of those associated with, with, our, with ourselves, but it's also highlighting characteristics that are so prevalent in men that are so-called men of God in this world today. So he withdrew himself. When he heard this, when he heard what they were trying to do, he withdrew himself, and they, so he separated. And what did he do? And I'm just going to close off with that. Um, he's going, he goes and he heals great multitudes on the Sabbath day. They're off holding the council to kill him. He's off healing on the Sabbath day. He healed them all in that on the Sabbath day. So Jesus continues to make his point, and I wish I could go into Isaiah 42, which is quoted, but I'm out of time. Um, But just in a nutshell, this challenge between Christ and the Pharisees over the Sabbath day, there's also another thread that kicks off at this point in the the ministry of Christ, and that's what's being highlighted in um, the record in Matthew. Um, where because Matthew quotes from Isaiah 42. Um, he could have just quoted the one verse, but he quotes this whole section. He quotes it for a reason, because not only are the Pharisees bitter and angry about the Sabbath, they're also bitter and angry about the way Christ deals with the Gentiles. Christ gets this response from the Gentiles, but he doesn't get that from the Pharisees. But that's all I'm going to go into right now.